Welcome to Victims and Villains YouTube slash Facebook uh, vlogs. I am your host, Captain Nostalgia. Victims and Villains is a nonprofit that educates and engages individuals on mental health awareness and suicide prevention through pop culture. And I'm here today talking with the writer and director and documentarian behind the new document documentary uh bullied mr thomas keith how are you doing today sir great uh great to be on i, I love your organization talking about the right things ah, thank you so much we're we're all fans of something right yes indeed well I, I guess for me the the first question that i i really had is this this documentary is it's it's heartbreaking it's hard to watch in certain parts um especially with some of the features of like the the cct footage uh and kind of like the the cams and you know the the phones it's it's really uncomfortable to watch it in some parts and so i have to commend you on on that that this movie doesn't push pull any punches back you know you guys are presenting the this is the reality uh, of bullying and i'm wondering specifically for you how this project got started yeah, let me let me uh, address both of those things. First of all, yes, I, I felt it was important not to pull any punches. I think people of a certain age, and I'm probably in that generation, don't see bullying as really that big of a deal. Now, they, they dealt with it in their past. And even on my Facebook page for the film, a lot of people will just you know smack the bully in the face and he'll go away. They have these very simple ideas about bullying and the consequences of it. So I thought, you know, it's, it's obviously more complicated than that, whether it's cyberbullying or face-to-face -face bullying that kids are going through today, many of them dealing with either mental health issues or pre-existing conditions of some. So, you know, it's, it's not an answer to say, just punch the, the person and they'll go away. Getting into this film, the, the reason I decided I was actually working on another film, which I'm almost wrapping right now, as a matter of fact, and we were talking in a production meeting about ways to get the audience engaged in understanding the importance of, of uh, the consequences of othering people and treating mis, you know, mistreating people. And that got us into a conversation about bullying. And that got me to the organization Stand for the Silent, which is uh, run by Kirk Smalley. He's the very first person, for those of yeah. you who see the film, the very first person you'll see, he lost his son uh, to suicide when his son was 12 after some horrendous bouts of bullying. And I met him and interviewed him in Oklahoma. And that was just a game changer and a life changer for me. After meeting Kurt, I knew I had to make this film. I knew it needed to be a standalone film and not simply a segment in some other film. And so that that's where the journey began. One of the things that, that I really appreciate it about this movie particularly was the the, the the blackout scenes for lack of a better word is what i'll call them, where you guys pulled real statistics it's not just you know hey these aren't just random shots that you're seeing is as an audience member in lang study also said that suicide rates jumped 95 percent for boys and 33 percent for girls during the school year and declined sharply during summer and winter breaks and that those were the that was stuff that i found myself even being in mental health uh you know of what we do work uh learning along with this and what was the when you guys were starting to kind of map out the, because this film covers so much, when you guys were mapping out exactly what subjects you guys wanted to cover with bullying and which statistics and professionals to talk to, what were uh, some of the, the challenges that you guys faced or, you know, the, the process and in, in kind of making a cohesive documentary? Sure. And again, I am an academic. I teach at the university yeah. level and I've published books and journal articles and all of that. So it's sort of the orientation I take into filmmaking is I'm still thinking about documenting my sources well, making sure that people understand that these sources are not one offs, as you were saying earlier, that these are trends and problems that are well documented with highly reliable sources. It's always something I bring to bear when I'm thinking about a project I'm doing so that people, 
you know, because even back in the day when Michael Moore was making his early films and people would say, well, where are you getting this, this, these, the documents, where are you getting the, the, the ground for this? And so he had to sort of scramble and put on his website all the places that he had researched. And so it kind of put documentary films on uh, notice that, you know, you need to back up your, your claims with reliable sources and people are going to be looking into that. And so, you know, looking at the CDC and looking at Yale University studies and things like that that have done longitudinal studies on this, and anyone who sees the film will note all the different scholars in the film, you know, from Yale to USC and all parts in between. So it is an orient. I guess, you know, one of the things I would say to your question is one of the challenges is when you bring in a lot of talking heads from universities, it may not be that entertaining to people. They may tune out or they start getting a little bit bored. So you're, you're bringing in the scholarship while still making it engaging to the viewer, I think is maybe a challenge. Yeah. And one of the things that for me, I think it kind of places it in perspective is you're not just seeing footage. You're not just hearing statistics. You're not just hearing from professionals, but you're also hearing from parents that have lost children to bullying. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a number of children that were bullied to the point of suicide in, in this one. And I, I'm curious about how the, the interviews with those particular parents and loved ones came to be. You know, for, it, Kirk was the first one that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, and it was a two hour sit down with him that was just, I, I don't know how to put it into words. He's very intense and understandably so. And I walked away from the interview just shaking, basically, and realizing this is going to be a real challenge. It was he and his organization who put me in touch with some other families. There's sort of a network, you know, that, that helps support one another around the world, really. And so I, I made contact, you know, with a, a, a parent, usually, told them about the project, told them about the film, and they may have some questions for me, and we'd go back and forth a little bit. Uh, until they would say they were either comfortable going forward with this interview or maybe not. When, when parents lose a child to suicide, which I, I can't even imagine, mm -hmm. I'm a father and I can't even imagine what that feels like. What I discovered was some parents want to be left alone. They don't want to talk about it and that's understandable. Other parents become activists. They really want to get involved and they don't want this to happen to someone else's family. So they're very much into it and they want to do whatever they can to help others. And I think for me being, you know, doing, having done suicide prevention and, and being such an advocate for, for the, you know, the better part of 10 years now, uh, one thing that I've kind of come to learn is that there's, the general population that doesn't really know about the, a lot of the, the statistics, they, they think that this is kind of like a, just a, a, a teenager problem. Mm -hmm. And they, they can't fathom that a, you know, a 10, an eight to 10 year old would take their own life. And this film showcases two cases that disprove that theory uh, in, and I, I'm blanking on the names, but there is an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old both that have taken their own lives because of bullying. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk on that for a few minutes and just kind of, you know, educate people that may have not seen the film yet about suicide, something that can literally touch anyone. Absolutely. Um, it is a little bit unusual for the age to go that low to eight. I mean, it does happen, but it's it's the middle school ages that experts have targeted where you get the most self-harm from kids going on and the most bullying as well. They go together. Um, yeah, you know, 5,000 American kids take their lives each year. 200,000 end up in the ER over self-harm issues. This is not an, uh, an issue of outliers. This isn't just a handful you know, of, of issues. This is a huge number. When I first saw that number, I, I didn't know it. I was shocked by how, how big a problem this is. And so, yes, kids all the way down to seven and eight and nine years old are self-harming. That can start with cutting behaviors. Uh, but a lot of times what happens is the, the child just becomes withdrawn. 
And so parents understandably will start, are worried, you know, I'm sending my kid to school and, and what should I look for? And sometimes there are no signs. Sometimes it's just a, a withdrawn sort of behavior. They don't want to go to school suddenly when school used to be fun for them and suddenly they don't want to go. Uh, the sad news, the unfortunate news is that the vast majority of kids who are bullied don't tell their parents that it's happening. And so a lot of times parents are completely in the dark that this is even going on. Um, and then they find out after some horrendous event or something like that, uh, that in fact it is going on. So it, it is happening into the very young ages. I can also tell you since um, research is important to me that in the African-American community, uh, suicide for both boys and girls is sharply up over the last 10 years. And researchers right now are, are trying to figure this out, I have to say. There's a lot of hypotheses. They're, they're working through this. I don't want to say here's the answer because there are scholars working on this and they are still trying to understand you know, the problems. But suicide is up for all groups, but particularly uh, kids of color right now are experiencing sharp increases. And we're trying to understand why. Yeah, uh, I from someone that used to go through bullying, like uh, when I go back and I look at some of my middle school years, like they are some of the the worst years that that I I endured as a child because of you know bullying and and trying to you know be included. And I think now you have the age of cyberbullying that is making it even worse and. How has cyberbullying really impacted the uh, practice of, of bullying and, uh, you know, middle school kids in particular, even high schoolers, you know, how have they been affected with uh, their depression and anxiety and even suicidation? Yeah, my sense of it, again, from talking to the experts and learning a ton from listening to them is that cyberbullying has really taken over as the primary way that kids are bullied. And it becomes, uh, you know, it becomes traumatic because they can't get away from it now. Uh, messages are sent and, and images are sent to their friends, family, sometimes their entire school, and there's no getting away from it. Some kids have actually been extorted, like the Carol Todd, Amanda Todd story in uh, British Columbia that's in the film. Now this has been turned into a movie, it became so famous that she was being extorted to show pictures of herself um, topless and this, you know, uh, in order yeah. to, uh, you know, and, and so here's this child who's just coming to middle school age you know, trying to figure out who she is. And suddenly she's under these pressures that, and these pictures are being sent to her friends, her families. And now kids are bullying her physically on top of that once the pictures become visible and public to everybody. So again, this was not the kind of bullying when I was their age. And when I tell people my age about what's going on, they have to understand it's, it's a new sort of era of the way things are done through yeah. digital media, uh, through bullying kids that we wouldn't have even thought about when we were that age. So yeah, we have to rethink these things and, uh, and, and make the approach differently and, and not take such an old fashioned view uh, about not just, you know, what bullying is doing, but how to solve it, how to, how to create solutions for it. Yeah. Yeah. And the film also talks about the, the impact of that as well. Um, talking about how 81% of young people stated that bullying online is easier to get away than with than bullying in person because you know you have these these keyboard warriors now that can basically say anything behind the guise of a computer and behind the guise of you know any identity online and no one's the wiser. Um, it makes sense, I, you know, it makes yeah. sense that you have the anonymity of sitting behind a computer screen so you can say and do things that you probably would never do face to face. And so it, it makes perfect sense that this is the 21st century way of bullying. And I'm, I'm also wondering, too, towards the end of the film, you defined what was bullying culture. And I'm wondering if you can kind of share that with some of the viewers right now. Uh, that may have never seen it, but, you know, wanting to know that this isn't just 
a, a plot point for for movies or for television shows that this is a reality and a subculture for some individuals. You know, this is huge. When people say, where are these kids getting the idea to bully? Where is this coming from? And a lot of times they're getting this from adults. And so, yes, I do have media and the sorts of programming, especially programming that's targeting kids uh, and leaders, whether they are political leaders, whether they're coaches. I mean, I played NCAA Division I sports and my coach or coaches, our coaching staff, you know, sometimes they were the biggest bullies of them all. They would use sexist and homophobic slurs to try to, quote, motivate us. And that would validate those kinds of behaviors in us. So, yes, I spent time looking at media and leadership and how when adults model bullying behaviors, what do they expect kids to do except emulate the very behaviors they're seeing? There are many adults in this country right now that think that, well, you've got to be a bully to get things done. That's just the way you get things done, especially after the last presidency. And I don't, and for those who don't know, I do have a, a section on Donald Trump, but this is not about politics. I don't put him in there to try to politicize this issue. It's whomever is leaders at the time, whether you know it's the, the federal government or state government or, or whomever, the way they're modeling behavior, it sets the tone for a lot of other people. And so, you know, when it comes to bullying, we need everybody involved. You know, it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is or, or religious affiliation. We need everybody involved to try to tackle this problem. But it starts, I think, with adults. We're the ones that need to model for kids how you behave. And if our modeling is, is bullying, if our model is cheerleading bullying, Kids are going to look at this and it validates them and they think that's the way you behave. That's how you get things done. That's how you get respect. And that's what starts happening. So we have to change our behaviors if we're going to really put a dent, you know, in the kind of bullying that we see. Yeah, because violence, you know, creates violence. Hatred creates hatred. Love creates love. And it's this effect. And I once read a quote from someone uh, in a book that said, you should never be afraid of what children are going to hear you say, but what they see you do, because they're going to do it. And it's almost kind of like, you know, this, this documentary, it really does engross so much. And one of the things that I really appreciated about it was what you're talking about, the fact that, you know, we do have these media and these influential people of power that are legitimizing bullying and in in a nutshell you're creating a culture where kids are looking and saying oh hey this is a person of power and they're making fun of xyz people groups this must be okay yes exactly so a lot of why bullying happens is because it works you hear that from a lot of the experts in the film that bullying works in the sense that it gives them what they're looking for, which is respect, which is power. And so they, be they believe this is the way you should behave. It validates those kinds of behaviors. Uh, and the kids who are bullies in school are lots of times very popular. You know, they're not the outliers uh, that maybe media makes them out to be. A lot of times they're popular kids. Um, it should though be said, and I've been saying this in a lot of interviews lately, that a lot of kids who bully other kids are themselves bullied in other contexts. And I think a lot of grownups need to understand that. If they think, well, just kick them out of school, you know, expel them from school or, or do something that's punitive. And I say, look, a lot of these kids who are the bullies, maybe at home, they're being bullied by an older brother, by dad, by whomever. And then they come to school and they start practicing these bullying behaviors. So there's a cycle going on of bullying. They're being bullied while they themselves become bullied. And one last thing to say about that, because the experts taught me this, is that those particular kids that are bullied somewhere and then bully somewhere else are at the highest risk for suicide. They are the very top rung of the, of the risk, at risk for self-harm. I've never thought about that, but that makes a, a lot of sense. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to belittle the issue, but I, I kind of want to, you know, bring it into context that list or viewers might uh, understand thinking of the pop culture, you know, the, the Simpsons, uh, the character Nelson Munts is kind of Bart Simpson's bully. And 
you have episodes where, you know, you just kind of see him as a bully and then you get to explore his home life and he is raised by a, you know, father's out of the picture and he's raised by a mother that doesn't really care. She's a drunk, she's a bully. And like you're saying, like, that is a cycle that it starts in the home and it's going out because those kids don't understand or had know anything else. Their environment is shaping them for who they are becoming in the world. There is no doubt about it that many of the kids who bully others are themselves troubled. They are troubled kids and they need counseling and help too. Just kicking them out of school, that's the, you know, the zero tolerance policy that some school districts have, first of all, has had no effect on dropping the rates of bullying. And secondly, when you do this, well, where do these kids go? It becomes basically the school to prison pipeline. You know, they don't get help. They don't get the kind of counseling they need to become better human beings and more productive people. So they a lot of them turn to crime or gang lives or things like that. So the zero tolerance doesn't work on lots and lots of levels. That's not the way to handle this. Instead, as I mentioned in the film, programs of social and emotional learning that started in Europe and are now everywhere, Canada, many districts in the United States have showed amazing results. We are seeing double digit drops in bullying episodes all around the country. Uh, Cleveland Unified seems has seen a 36% drop in bullying since they instituted social and emotional learning in 2008. We know this stuff works. It's, you know, there are longitudinal studies to back this up. And so part of what I want to, people to take away from this film, especially educators and those of you who work for school districts, is start thinking about how you can integrate social emotional learning into your curricula. Because not only, listen to this, not only do you reduce bullying? Guess what goes right along with that? When bullying goes down, grades go up, graduation rates go up, everybody wins. Suddenly a kid is not sitting there in a math class, scared to death of what's going to happen when that bell rings and he has to walk out into the hallway to whatever horror you know, awaits him. So if we can institute these programs, you reduce bullying, Kids graduated higher rates, their grades go up, and they are in, able to go to college and they have better lives. It is a win win for everybody. It's one of the last subjects that's touched on in the movie. But like you're saying, like the, the test scores in Ohio went up 13%, the high school graduation rates raised uh, 20%, and there was a 15% uh, reduction in suspensions. And you'd already mentioned the 36% in reduction for bullying and i i graduated in in 2009 and i've never heard of this uh you know would you the the emotional yeah, the social emotional the social work. emotional yeah it began in finland actually and one of the professors uh one of the uh, professors from ucla is in the film uh yana yuvonen she's the the blonde haired lady and she was one of those that that uh that crafted the program for Finland. She is from Finland and now teaches at UCLA. And, and so they started instituting it in the schools there and the results were dramatic. And so it began to spread to other European nations, many Canadian school districts began, and now slowly uh, US school districts, some of them are starting to adopt versions of social and emotional learning into their curricula. As a teacher, what teachers will sometimes say is, I, I'm already overburdened. I have so much work to do. I've got, you know, 40 kids in a classroom and you want me to bring more stuff into the classroom? What they're doing is they're instituting it into the already existing curricula. So it's not like bringing in another course or having to spend more time. They bring it into the work they're already doing. And that's why I brought those teachers in at the very end. They're here in California and they're instituting these things right into their classroom curricula. And the results have been phenomenal. So we know it works and it works on lots of levels and not just bullying. I want this to be one of the takeaways from this film. When people watch the film, it, I, I only made this film when I, when I said to Kirk and I said to others, this will be a hopeful film. This won't simply 
here's all the problems and then have a good life. I've seen bullying films like this. There are films right now that have much bigger budgets than mine that go through these, these horrible episodes and then they just end and that's it. And you're looking at the screen going, well, what was my takeaway from that? What did I learn from that? Sure. So I felt I need hope. I know parents want hope. I want, you know, the kids themselves want hope. And so that's how the film ends. And, and I, for me, that's the most important part of the film, that there are solutions. No, we probably can't eradicate bullying 100%, just like you, you can't probably eradicate racism 100% or any other problematic behaviors. But we can reduce it. We can mitigate it. And we know how. I'm wondering before we go ahead and uh, close out the interview, if you can just kind of define what social emotional learning is for viewers. Yeah, you know, it, it's a very simple, when you first hear this, folks, you're going to think this sounds oversimple, but it's a very simple concept. And it's really the promotion of kindness. It's the promotion of kindness. And so you have uh, poets like, uh, 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 Maya Angelou, for instance, when I was in the classroom with those, and these kids were probably third grade, second grade, something like that. And they're bringing in Maya Angelou's poems and they were reciting that together as kids. And these poems were very much about kindness and, and helping others and making people feel good uh, instead of you know bullying them and putting them down and seeing what's wrong with somebody because they may look different or they may talk different than you or something like that. And so it's very simple things and it is built into age appropriate curricula. So these are for kids. It starts in kindergarten and then they take it all the way through sixth grade here in California. They go to middle school and they probably aren't having that same reinforcement. I mean, they could do it in middle school. You would just have to change it a little bit to be more age appropriate to that, to that group. But it, it's the promotion of kindness in, in, in curricula alongside you know the reading writing math and science and everything else that kids are doing and it takes uh, the one principal i have a, a school principal and, and says that we we really don't have problems with fights anymore if there was some little problem and i go what happened they both say oh i did this and i didn't they just fess up she said that never would have happened 10 years ago when i was a principal everyone clams up and no one wants to get in trouble and that's just not the case anymore that's awesome to hear. And I strongly encourage you guys to check out the movie Bullied. It is now available on uh, video on demand and wherever you guys get your digital movies. Uh, Thomas, thank you so much for uh, checking out, uh, well, sitting down and, and talking about the, you know, your journey through making this film and, and really what the film meant to you and the importance of this movie. Uh, where can people find more about the movie online? You know, they can go to my website. Um, it's easy to remember. My name is Tom Keith and then dot com. That's it. Tom Keith dot com. It'll come right up. It's on Tubi right now for free. So, you know, if you're watching your nickels and dimes, just, you know, dial it up on Tubi and you can watch it right now. All right. Well, uh, I just want to encourage viewers right now that if you are watching this and you are someone you know is struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. As of this video, there are 130 suicides that take place every day on American soil. And when we look to international numbers annually, we find that there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So please, if you or someone you know is struggling, I encourage you guys to reach out in the show notes below, wherever you guys are viewing this, you guys will find uh, a, a link to our mental health library. It's victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope, where you guys can find resources, including getting connected with uh, counselors, the National Suicide Hotline, uh, RAIN, and more and we just want to encourage you guys and just remind you that you have value and that you have worth and that's the reason we make this content so please stay with us and make sure you guys uh well stay with us and we'll see you guys soon where